Hello, my friends, and namaste. The image that you just saw was a painting that I did about 20 years ago, and it's called an icon. It is used in liturgical services and Orthodox churches of Christianity throughout the world, such as the Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Coptic Orthodox, and the Roman Catholics, among other Orthodox churches. Now, I used to paint icons, and I did it for a particular church in, that was located in Pasadena. It's no longer there. I did about 256 of these icons. So I learned, um, I learned a language, basically, because icons are painted in a very specific way. As a matter of fact, they're not even called uh, paintings. They're called writings. And an iconographist usually, although I wasn't one, <laughs> uh, usually is a monk who is celibate. And he'll fast for 40 days before he even picks up the first brush. Now, when they are painting them, they are, they are writing them and inscribing from an original. They're copying it from an original. And hopefully that's going to be faithful, a faithful copy that can go into a new church that is being built. So it's very specific. It's very, um, it's a very strong tradition that still carried from, you know, 2,000 years ago. The first parishioners that attended the liturgies in these Orthodox churches, most of them were illiterate. They could not read nor write, but they could read an icon because that icon supported everything that they experienced during a liturgy when they would go into worship. All their senses were involved when they would go to a church to worship. It, their vocal cords were used in chanting and singing. Their, their smell smelt the incense that was being burned. They could hear the bells the, um, as the uh, bells were being rung, or they could hear the chanting, the singing, as well as their participation with that. And their sight was being used through the visual, visualization that they saw with the priests wearing the vestments and the way that the altar was set up and the icons that were presented uh, on display in the iconostasis at the altar and also around the walls and up at the ceiling and inside the dome and sometimes even on the outside of the building. As they would hear the scriptures read or the, the priest would give his sermon, they would see and, and hear those stories and be reminded of those stories through the icons, the imagery, the symbolism that was in there. Now, my purpose for this is just to give a basis of where I'm coming from, what my understanding is. As an iconographist, as an artist, I understand the language that's, that is used in iconography. And having having a love for cookeries and having been collecting cookeries for a long time and also being someone who meditates and practices yoga i am very familiar with the hindu faith and i could see the imagery i could see the symbolism that has been imparted to the to the icon of of the cookery so when i hold a cookery i don't just see a historical weapon that was used and made famous by the gurkhas I see um, an icon that was created by the Kami to support their religious faith. This is a tool that everybody uses in Nepal, from the housewife who's, who's chopping her vegetables and, and making her meal, or going out in the garden and to, um, to trim out the weeds or whatever. She's using that kukri. Also, the traveler who wants to go into the Himalayas and maybe see a religious site, and he needs to hike up those those steep trails and camp, set up a camp where he has to build a shelter and a fire to keep warm by, and it, if need be, even to protect himself from uh, a predator that may be wanting to make him a meal. You have the 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 farmers who would carry the cookery and harvest their crops to take to the village market. Or you would have the priest and the shaman who would go take the cookery into somebody's home to drive out an evil spirit or to bring healing to a sick uh, relative or, or perhaps bring prosperity to that family. 
The priests would use it during the time of great festivals, particularly the one festival where animal sacrifice was, was performed. Although that is a di diminishing um, um, event that is taking place in Nepal due to the passing of certain animal rights laws. At one time, it was used during where, where 50,000 uh, buffaloes and, and goats and, and chickens were being sacrificed to the gods. So this was this is a an icon that and a tool that was used on all aspects of society. When a a bride and her groom were getting married, the groom would, in his patuka would have a very elaborately designed cookery and its scabbard put into his patuka, and it part, was a a part of his um, his groom's outfit as he goes to the altar with his bride and, and they become united together as one. So it, it is used and is the symbolism is used and has very important meaning to the people of Nepal. Oftentimes as we on Facebook get involved in, in conversations. We'll debate on, on certain things. And particularly one of my favorite debates that I love is what is the purpose of the Kadi? This right here. I've heard it said that during combat, when you are fighting an opponent, you're going to catch and trap the opponent's blade in this little notch here. Well, I'll tell you, I have some cookeries that have a very small notch some that are a little bit bigger, some that are completely enclosed when you're like uh, the chit lane, um, it's completely enclosed. So you're not going to be able to catch an opponent's uh, uh, blade and trap it there. So that to me is completely ridiculous. Another thing as a martial artist, I don't want my opponent's blade coming anywhere close to my fingers. And, and depending on that, my aim is just not that good. Never has been. If I'm going to parry a blade, I'm going to use the side of the blade or the spine of the blade. I'm not even going to use the cutting edge. So I don't want anything coming close to that to damage the cutting edge or here. But the Gurkhas who use these, their training is that every strike that you take is a de decapitation blow. It's a kill blow. It's meant to, to, with one single strike, take out an enemy. So they're not thinking about you know, parrying and trapping an opponent's uh, blade in the county. Another uh, favorite of mine is that it's there to cause the dripping of blood not to fall on the hand. Well, I got news to it for you. If you're, if you're in combat and you're striking, I don't know if any of you have seen Braveheart, but that was a great depiction of what it was in medieval times for the for the warriors, when they went hand to hand with swords and shields and and axes and blades, they be, it was a bloody mess. There was blood everywhere, everywhere. I'm sorry if you've ever seen an artery cut, it squirts out blood. So there's no way you're going to worry about a little bit of blood dripping down on your hand. And if you've also seen any of the videos on YouTube of the priest or the, the people decapitating the bulls, they were doing hundreds of them. Do you think they're going to worry about a little blood on their hand when their whole body is covered in blood? Uh, I'm sorry. Catching, uh, causing the drip of the blood not to hit the hand is hogwash. First of all, you got multiple surfaces for this blood to go in. The whitest surfaces is the side of the blade, and that is going to go into your hand. So with that being said, hopefully I'm dispelling that, that falsehood as well. So what is the county? What's the purpose of the county? Well, one that might be somewhat reasonable is when you are sharpening the blade, you have a starting point and an end point. When you're taking the, the chakmak and going along the edge, you have a stopping point, you have a, a, a beginning point. But you know what? That's an after effect. That is, that's just, okay, it's there. I can start here and I can go. And I can finish there. But it wasn't designed for that purpose. So what is the design? What do I say the design is? This is my opinion. 
but it's based on some historical and some uh, religious aspects that make, I think once I'm, I'm through talking about it, you might understand where the imagery and the, the symbolism and how the cookery can be viewed as an icon to remind its user of Shiva, of that we are not this body and the body is not us, that we are supreme consciousness and we are all united. We're uni we are part of the supreme conscious self. So let's start talking about some of the imagery. Now I have, I've got some visual aids that hopefully will help um, strengthen and help you understand. So let's talk about the principal God in Nepal. Now, the principal god of Nepal is part of the trinity of Hinduism, and that trinity is Brahman, Vishnu, and Shiva. But Shiva is the principal god. He is the, he is the supreme consciousness. All the other gods that exist below him are all expressions of him. It's kind of like when we look at it through Christianity, the trinity. There are three different individuals, but they're all of the same essence. They are one God. So it's the same in, in Hinduism. All the gods come to that one point where they are all the supreme consciousness, Shiva. So Shiva, when he is depicted in the iconography in Hinduism, he is shown with various different things that he has with him or on him or that he carries. One of and and here I've made a little a little sign here a little paper with uh, these symbols. You'll see the trident, the moon, the drum, uh, the snake, the bull, and the third eye. So we're going to talk about each of those and how they are in the icon of the cookery. First, we'll talk about the the one I think is the most obvious, and that is the trissel, or also known as the trident. That is the spear, the trident, that uh, Shiva is holding in his hands. Now, there's it's a three-pronged spear, basically, and the trident has a left side, a left side and a right side, which are the basic uh, um, symbolism of duality in in our physical, this physical illusion or this physical part of Maya. Maya. It is also the dualism that we see in masculine and feminine. It is the duality that we see in this in this world of, of uh, positive and negative, of light versus darkness, and that's what it's symbolizing. It also can symbolize the Trinity of Brahman and Vishnu with Shiva in the center as the supreme. Now the center part also uh, symbolizes the dormant space between the duality. Okay. Now what is the other, uh, and where is that symbolism on the cookery? Let's, let's see that. It is the cowdy. <laughs> It is what we were just talking about. Now, if you look in the positive side of it, what what this is, is you'll see the outline of the two sides of the the uh, of the trident and the center <coughs> pillar of the trident. And 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 therefore you have Shiva's trident there. That's the, that's within the cowdy. Okay. Now there's another aspect of the cowdy that has symbolism too, but we'll talk about that in its negative space rather than the positive space of, of what we're seeing. The next uh, symbol is the moon. The moon that you see in Shiva's hair, hair is a crescent. It's not a full moon. It's, it's a crescent moon. Where do we see the crescent moon in the icon of the cookery? Well, I'm using a um, 
the Hanchi Limbata, which is one of my favorite designs of the cookery and shapes of the cookery, but it is also one of the oldest shapes used in the cookery. This uh, predates the war between Nepal and Great Britain. The, uh, this is a very popular um, cookery shape that was used. And it is very pronouncedly curved, which symbolizes or shows the crescent moon in Shiva's hair, the basic shape of the cookery. What does the moon symbolize? It is also known as Soma. It symbolizes intoxication, yet fully aware and awake. Now this intoxication, we're not talking about in being enumerated with wine or, or strong alcohol or drugs. We're talking about the intoxication that comes from one's consciousness being expanded as one is becoming enlightened. And, um, and oftentimes, the, the, there's the emotions that are involved where you experience happiness and joy. That's what's being depicted here. Also, uh, we have the drum. Now, where is the drum? Uh, image. I'm going to show an old uh, cookery that I have where I think the drum shape is really um, shown very well. The drum that is used on, that as actually hanging from the trident of, of Shiva is not a large drum that we're drumming. We're talking about a small drum that has two strings with uh, bone or, or some something heavy. It could even be tied leather. And you're taking this drum and you're uh, going this way on it, and the strings are going on both ends, hitting the the drum part of the the cylinder that you're holding, and shaking. That drum has a shape where it comes in in the center, and in the center there is lines. There is a ribbing in the center. That ribbing we see in the ring on on the handle. Now the ring is placed in this particular case in a more strategic way, in a more um, design functional way, where when we grip it our fingers get locked on it so that our hand doesn't slide up on the cut, cutting part of the blade and cut our hand. So instead of having a cross, a coulion or cross guard to prevent our hand from doing that, the, the ring on the handle function is for that purpose. So when we, our hand is locked in it on a fist grip, which is the proper way of holding a cookery, our hand will not slide up. But this, as, an, as, an, as, as a symbol, it symbolizes that drum of Shiva. What does a drum stand for? It is the universe which is always expanding and collapsing and re-expanding. Now, Shiva is known as the creator, destroyer, God. He will create the universe and then destroy the universe and then recreate the universe. But on a spiritual note, is what he, is, what he will do for a person who is um, worshiping him who is seeking self-realization, enlightenment, is he will destroy that which hinders us. He will destroy evil. But on a, a better way, I think, is he destroys disillusionment and um, ignorance. And then he recreates in us our true nature, our true identity, who we really are, and that is Shiva himself, that we share the oneness and unity with him. And that unity we all share in, in a collective consciousness, in the supreme consciousness, in the supreme self. Another uh, symbol is the bull, and that's Nadi. And Nadi is, symbolizes Dharma. He is wisdom and righteousness. When we are truthful, the infinite consciousness is within us. 
okay? He is, he is also the vehicle that Shiva will ride. He will climb on top of the bull and ride and go places. Now, the, as anybody who knows anything about uh, Hinduism, they know that the cow is sacred. Nobody is to kill a cow. It is not eaten. It's not used for food in that way. Yes, the milk of the cow is, is drunk and cheese is made, but it is not by the death of the cow. Now, where is the cow, the sacred cow, where is Nadi represented in the cookery? Again, it is in the cowdy. But in this, this time, we're thinking of the negative space, where there isn't anything. That's the pierced shape. And that is in the shape of a cow's hoof. A cow's hoof is, is split. If you're familiar with the Judeo, uh, Christian faith, uh, whether it be Islam, uh, Judaism, and Christianity, uh, the clean food to eat is the cow, not the not the pork. And the way that you know uh, or identify a clean animal to eat is whether its hooves are split or not. In this particular case, in Hinduism, it is to remind us that that's not the clean food to eat, that this is the sacred cow. This is the cow that represents uh, Nadi, which is the vehicle that Shiva rides. But it is also the cow that represents the Divine Mother, Shakti. She is the one who provides the nourishment of all creation. So it is also to remind the user, you never kill a cow with the cookery. <laughs> Along with that, What's also interesting is your a Gurkha is not to use the cookery to kill women and children. So the cow represents righteousness and wisdom, and that's what that Im, that symbolism should remind the user: always be truthful, always use good wisdom, judgment. It's also to remind us of Shiva himself and how we are one, how, how we are the supreme consciousness within once we become self-realized and we understand this. What's another aspect or another Im image of Shiva is the third eye. Now, the third eye located, it's actually the pineal gland that's located in the center of our brain. If we were to take a take a rod and put it through the sides of our head or the front and back or the front and back of our head right at the very center is where the pineal gland is and what's very interesting about the pineal gland is that it has a retina and it has a lot of the same features that our eyes have it is also where um, DMT is created in our brain and it is also where melatonin we uh, how we know when to go to sleep and when to w rise and wake up. That third eye is the the area of where enlightenment occurs, where we spiritually can see, okay, if I may. Well, on Shiva, that eye is always closed when he is in deep in meditation. When the third eye is open, oftentimes whatever is in its path, whatever it's in its vision, gets destroyed. Now, where this is Im important for us as a symbol, as, an, as part of this icon, is if you look at the handle, the top part, it is not round like a circle. It is oval, very much like our eye. And when you hold the kukri in its right position, such as this way, okay, that shape is oval like the third eye of Shiva. Now, what could that symbol mean to us? What, we're going to be destroyed? No. What perhaps will get destroyed is our ego. Our ego gets destroyed. As we are pursuing, as we're our goal is to become enlightened, to become one with our true nature, our true selves. 
And if, if that's our goal, then when that third eye opens, it destroys, it dissolves ignorance. It, it destroys our ego and allows us to come face to face with our true nature of who we truly are and become enlightened. Now, this is an old kukri, and there isn't, you know, the tang doesn't go all the way through. There's no bug cap. There's nothing that really reminds us of an eye here other than the shape. On other kukris that might have a stick tang, you will see a butt plate and a keeper. And when you see the butt plate, plate and keeper, it is still very oval shape with the center part of being very much like um, the eye of Shiva. In this particular case, it's the diamond shape. This part being in enlightenment, moksha, our supreme goal of self-realization. Now, you'll see lots of cookeries that will have a variety of different keepers. Some are in the shape of the sun, a very important imagery in Nepal. And you'll see on their flag is the crescent moon and the sun. And, the, and they have very significant spiritual as well as uh, cultural importance. But it's all based in Hinduism. Now, last but not least, is Vasuki. This is the snake. And what does the snake represent that's around uh, uh, Shiva's neck? Is it can be viewed as the ego. Once we master the ego, it can be worn around the neck like an ornament, like it does with, uh, with Shiva. The poison of the ego no longer affects nor threatens Shiva. For he is fully conscious, fully consciously realized. Okay, And we who are striving for that enlightenment, that self-realization, the ultimate goal is that our egos can be worn around our neck like ornaments. In other words, we are not this body and this body is not me. But I am conscious supreme. What I do or what I haven't done doesn't matter. It is as, as though we, we view it as though we have already become enlightened. So now where is, um, where is Fasuki? And to be quite honest, I'm not really sure where Fasuki would, would be on, on the cookery itself, except for maybe it might be this line that is often grooved in here. Uh, but also, there, it's been suggested that that represents an arrow. It could be re represent, the, um, in some cases, the bow uh, that shoots the arrow. And it also could be the, sh the sword of, of um, Shakti when she is Durga or when she's Kali. And the sword is to drive away evil to drive that which is harmful to those whom she loves. And we are the objects of her love. So these are the symbols that are resident and put in to the cookery. And I hope that you find this interesting. I hope that you found it helpful in identifying the various different uh, icons, symbols, that are in the icon of the cookery. So when you take that cookery out on your next camping trip, it might make you pause and stop and think, hmm, well, it's great for chopping wood. <laughs> Anyways, I hope that you found this helpful. Um, if you would like any more information on the symbolisms and what they stand for in greater depth, I'll be more than happy to help uh, to share with you what I've learned and uh, point you to some books and, and uh, uh, resources in which you can learn more on your own, uh, what the symbolisms mean and, and why they are 
uh, present in the in the, your cookery. Um, thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you do have any questions, please message me on Facebook on Blue Dragonfly Cookery and I'm sorry, Blue Dragonfly Trading Post. And if you're interested in purchasing any cookeries, um, please visit me on my website at Dragonfly Cookery and Knives. Again, thank you very much and namaste.